The first game that I ever remember playing was Space Invaders on the Atari 2600. I was six years old and it was at my friend's house and I was just blown away by the fact that you could manipulate an image on your television. And ever since then, I knew that I wanted to work in video games. Discover the Atari that opened your eyes to the world's most popular home video game like Space Invaders. First console was the Atari 2600, which to be fair, was fun for a brief period of time, but was sank by a, a glut of crappy games that came out in the 80s and caused, of course, the video game crash. I didn't play games for another year or two after that until the Nintendo Entertainment System came along and I was hooked. So when I was uh, about 12 years old, I was so hooked on Nintendo that my friends at school called me Nintendo Boy and people I didn't even like called me Nintendo Boy. It was a compliment and an insult. I loved playing games as much as I could. That went on from there, the Sega Genesis, the Super Nintendo, the PlayStation, PlayStation 2. And as I grew up, the industry grew up around me. And then I eventually, of course, landed a job in the business and found myself at uh, E3 in Atlanta many years ago, roughly 96 or 97 showing off Unreal, which was the biggest game that we had done to date. I was living in my mother's house and I was 16 or 17 years old and I made a point and click adventure game called The Palace of Deceit. And this was back when there was the era of shareware where you released episode one of the game and then people sent you money to get episodes two and three. So I put out a version of the game and within a week I was receiving a decent amount of actual checks in the mail and actually was able to make enough money to live a fun teenage lifestyle. You know, one where I could buy more computers, not beer, mind you. So when I was at Epic Games, we were largely known for games like Jazz Jackrabbit, Unreal, Unreal Tournament, which were great, wonderful titles. But uh, I wanted to move the company forward when I was there. I wanted to do a different kind of shooter. One that felt a little bit grittier, one a little, a little bit darker, and one that kind of played unlike anything that people had really seen. And through much iteration and working with a lot of very talented people, we were able to birth the very first Gears of War game. So when I worked at Epic and worked on Gears of War, you know, cutscenes I, I thought were a necessary part of the game in order to move it forward. And for that kind of game that we were building at the time, they very much were and Greg Mitchell did a fantastic job directing those. Uh, as I move forward, if I get back in the industry, I'm hoping to make games that don't have any cutscenes at all, because I believe that every moment should ask something of the player, and the story of the gameplay itself should be the thing that's the most compelling, as opposed to the story that the designer is trying to force on you. When the question of mentor comes up, uh, I have to cite Shigeru Miyamoto, not because he directly taught me anything personally, because I only run into him once a year and get a photo op with him, of course, but from playing the games that he designed early on in his career, and even to some extent later, uh, his lessons on how to teach the players something, how to have secrets in the world, how to continue to have good pacing in your game and to create mystery in your world. Those are things that I learned inherently from uh, playing his products. There's an old saying that says that video games are a lean forward experience, whereas film and television are a lean back experience. The thing about games is that you're driving every moment of the game. Every beat needs to require input from you in order for the game to move forward. A friend of mine a while back actually compared games to novels and the fact that if you stop reading, the novel doesn't keep going. Video games are very much the same. I believe that video games sit squarely at the intersection of art and science. I mean, if you look at the staff that builds a video game, you have a music composer, you have a writer, you have an artist who can do sketch work, you have a technical artist, you have level designers who create spaces much like architects. It really is kind of the avengers of talent when you really think about it. Recently in the industry, there's been a lot of concern over games and nickel and diming players with what we call microtransactions, where you can buy a hat for your character and things like that. The things that people forget is that the old arcade games were essentially a similar model where you put in a quarter to play the game for maybe five to 10 minutes, hope you didn't die and put in another quarter. There's a reason they were called quarter munchers. As far as I'm concerned, I wish tomorrow was the day that there were no more discs because I am so spoiled by things like Steam and the App Store. When a game comes out day one and you immediately have it and you can start playing it, 
I'm not a big fan of actually physically going to the store for anything. I think it's a giant waste of time and I buy my toilet paper online. I think crowdfunding uh, websites like Kickstarter are brilliant. I think there's been instances where they've helped out developers who've been in uh, sticky situations. But I think for every developer that has an amazing success story on there, there's 50 whose games never see the light of day or they can't finish their game or they don't fulfill the orders or the wishes. So I think the success stories are amazing. But we have to remember that there is risk there as well. I think we're in a space now where with the internet and social connectivity and message boards and YouTube, we're in a world where a visionary can put out his game uh, that is what he wanted to create. And then it becomes the audience's game. Uh, you look at a game like Minecraft, whereas Notch and his team over there had something in mind that they wanted to make. And once it came out, it became its own creature, it became its own living entity, thanks to the connected nature of the world in which we live. And that is the holy grail of game design. Exactly. A lot of uh, people like to kind of fear monger about the fact that the little guy can't exist anymore, that you have to have 50 to $100 million to make a game. And that's completely not true. I still want to play games like Assassin's Creed and Gears of War and Dishonored, but at the same time, uh, a guy like Phil Fish can make a game like Fez. Uh, there are independent games festivals out there now. There are game jams. There are mobile games. There's uh, downloadable games on Steam. Now, more than ever, with the connected nature of the world, it's possible for one guy in his garage to make tomorrow's next big hit. So if you look at the march of technology with Moore's law that says computers double in speed every couple of years, I think video games in the next 30 to 40 years are going to be unimaginable. I think in the next 10 years, they're going to be just crazy. I think we're gonna eventually wind up with what is essentially the Star Trek holodeck and eventually the matrix where you can't tell fantasy from reality and you can live the dream that you've always wanted to live of flying or being James Bond or being a quarterback. The gaming industry in 2013 and beyond is in a major state of transition. If I could predict this future, then maybe I'd be in a bigger house. I don't know, because right now it's the wild, wild west. There are dozens of platforms on which to game. You look at everything from iPad to PC to next, next generation consoles to even virtual reality headsets. Those games will need to be entirely different games. It's a completely fractured market, and it's basically capitalism at its finest, where the good stuff will rise and the bad stuff will sink and go away. I think when you look at the development of games in the future and how it's going to change, when you look at AAA, I think you're going to continue to see more and more outsourcing. You're going to see a situation where multiple studios and multiple physical locations are required to ship a very large AAA product. I think in the indie scene, you're going to see one-off guys who can do it alone in their garage, but also guys who have virtual offices where they have their friend in Chicago who does the artwork, the animator in Maryland who does the animations, and the guy who's located in California coding it all together and designing it. I think you're going to have a lot of distributed development moving forward in the future. I believe 100 years in the future, we will achieve what is essentially called the singularity, where we can all essentially have our brains and our consciousness and our spirituality uploaded to a computer and then officially live in the matrix and fight off agents much like Neo. I know Kung Fu. You know, after 20 years of doing this, uh, I'm a little bit burnt out and I've been enjoying sleeping until noon every day and taking random vacations wherever I want. Uh, however, that creative itch keeps coming back. I have a little uh, notebook next to my bed and I find myself getting up at seven in the morning and writing down ideas for characters and weapons and universes. And uh, sooner or later, those ideas have to come to fruition. So I'll probably be back. He ruined my dream journal! I'm asked on a regular basis how to get in the gaming industry on you know Twitter and in person when I run into fans at conferences and things like that. Now in 2013 and beyond, it is easier than ever to get into the industry. And how do you want to become a good chef? Start cooking and burn a lot of dishes. You know, you just don't become a great chef just by eating food and sitting around all day long. That's how you get fat. Get off your butt, you know, learn 3D Studio Max, learn Visual C++, do something and post it on the internet and continue to chase after it because the dream is there if you want it. My biggest hopes uh, for the gaming industry moving forward, I, I would hope that 
more and more people play games in general. I think there are a lot of fears out there right now about gamers being afraid of iPad games like Angry Birds being successful or Facebook games being successful. And I'm like, look, at the end of the day, more people are playing games that might not have played games to begin with. And I hope that those people will start with a game like Angry Birds and graduate to games like Gears of War. One of the things I'm most excited about is virtual reality. I think a lot of us can remember back in the early 90s when movies like The Lawnmower Man came out and VR was going to be the next big thing. And it never really was because the headsets were big and clunky. The graphics were crappy. Well, thanks to recent advances in smartphone technology and screens and tracking devices, VR is set for a big comeback. Uh, I've used the Oculus VR headset, which is incredibly impressive. It really is like putting a portal to another dimension on your head. Look forward to that. Something that uh, upsets me in the industry right now is the amount of flack the business gets um, from people who don't understand video games properly, who don't have any proper evidence citing that video games are directly linked to aggression or violence, and see video games as the new rock and roll, or the new talking pictures, or the new Dungeons and Dragons, and they believe that that newfangled thing is corrupting our children, whereas your average age of a gamer is something like 37 or 38 now, and you have adult dads who are playing games with their kids now. I think this country is in a major transitional period right now. When you have uh, mass shootings, uh, people look at a myriad of things that can cause it, and they often look for a silver bullet in these incredibly painful moments. And I think when you look at video games, it's one of those things that show me a 17-year-old boy that doesn't play video games, and then I'll show you a weird one. I think gamer culture in the next 10 to 20 years is going to continue to evolve into its own sort of religion. Uh, when you go to something like PAX and you see the cosplay that these kids make that they spend all year on and they bloody their hands selling the thing and they go all over town and the internet in order to find the right boots for the character. And then they you know, write fan fiction and they mod the game. I mean, it's essentially its own religion for these kids. And uh, hopefully they'll grow up and uh, wind up potentially in the industry and, and maybe work for me someday or maybe wind up you know, normal productive members of society. I think a lot of the big publishers and the console manufacturers are all fighting for the living room. It's, it's not just even them in the video game space. Television makers are fighting for it. Cable companies, satellite uh, operators are fighting for it. At the end of the day, he who gets all of the content licensed onto his platform will win. Because I don't want to have to go over to my cable box to watch Dexter. I don't want to have to go over to my iPad to watch HBO Go to watch Game of Thrones. I don't want to have to turn on my TV to watch funny videos on America's Funniest Home Video or anything like that. I want it all in one location and I'm tired of switching away. My favorite moments uh, and most interesting moments in the industry are at conferences and video games, conferences and uh, things like Comic-Con um, because I've carved out a very fun kind of fame for myself, whereas in the real world, I only get recognized once a week, twice a week, maybe occasionally at the supermarket or at a bar. But when I go to these shows, it's like nonstop and the fans are just great and excited. And they sometimes get so excited that they shake and their, if their iPhone doesn't have its flash on, they have to take the photo 10 times because it's blurry. And they always ask, is it okay to get a photo? I'm like, you know, if we're ever at the day where it's not okay to get a photo, you can kick me in the nuts. If I were to just shoot from the hip and say, what's my greatest achievement for my career thus far, I would of course say Gears of War becoming a billion dollar franchise has been great. But more importantly, I'd say it's those moments where I see that, you know, deaths of key characters really affected people and made them cry in the game, or they got tattoos of the you know, logo of the game on their bodies, or a man and his wife met on Xbox Live playing the game and now they play co-op every night. Those, I think, are my greatest achievements. One of the biggest milestones uh, career-wise for me was uh, during Gears of War 1's first public debut. Uh, we were at E3, I think, in about 2005, and it was at uh, Manners or Grauman's Chinese Theater, I can't remember what they're calling it these days in Hollywood, and uh, I had to demonstrate the game live in front of a packed house of journalists. Uh, had I known how significant that moment would be in my career, I probably would have crapped my pants right there in front of everybody else. But I was a little younger, a little cockier back then, and luckily I pulled it off, and the crowd went wild, and it was essentially the birth of Gears of War becoming a legit franchise. I'd say the biggest surreal moment for me in my career was being at a Comic-Con party 
whereas we were showing gears and then later in the night being in an after party where my wife, Felicia Day, and Joss Whedon are essentially engaged in a dance-off. I will never forget that night. Generally speaking, I can tell if a game's going to be good in the first hour or two. And unfortunately, recently, a lot of blockbuster games that really take their time in the first hour getting going uh, with protracted tutorials and things like that. And it's like, look, I can figure out that left stick walks, okay? Just get me to the meat of the game. Let me figure things out for myself and let me discover. The great games have designers asking something of the player. They ask them to try something, to learn something, and to discover new things uh, on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, essentially. My favorite game that I'm playing right now is the Telltale Games Walking Dead episodic series. I'm a big fan of the graphic novels. The show is largely great. Um, but if you told me that there would be a game largely comprised of what are essentially quick time events like Dragon's Lair that I actually found compelling, I tell you you're full of crap. However, this game really commits to what it's doing and I think it's going to be one of the best examples of interactive narrative. What I love most about games, I'd have to say, is the fact that it allows you to essentially live a dream. Uh, ever since I was a child, I've been a very vivid dreamer, and even uh, right now in my late 30s, I've gotten better at controlling my dreams in what they call lucid dreaming. And I think a great video game essentially gives you that fantasy where you can really empower the player, frighten the player, make the player feel something that he couldn't feel on any other medium.